I'm speaking today with Raya Salter, who is, besides a lovely screen personality, who was had her own TV program when she lived here in Hawaii for a few years, um, is is now part of the Facing Future team. I've been a clean energy um, advocate for several years. My training is in um, energy regulation. I'm a, a lawyer by trade. Um, I practiced energy regulation in the context of um, international mergers and acquisitions and transactions, uh, but went on to do clean energy advocacy um, with a focus on um, uh, the integration of renewable energy into the grid, um, and then more recently, um, issues of um, energy and climate justice. And thank you for that, Raya. And I've asked Raya to study up on something that I consider to be perhaps the greatest risk to life on earth that we're currently facing. Um, so I'll need to do the initial discussion of why I make that claim, Raya, and then we'll talk about it. So there is, um, well, everyone is, is fairly well familiar with the controversies and the dangers of conventional old style nuclear power. Um, there are people who defend the old style nuclear power. I don't defend it because it, it's, it was heavy handed. The equipment is, is out of date. Many plants are being operated beyond their, the, life, the lifetime they were engineered for. Mm -hmm. um, because once you're making money with some, the people making money with it don't want to decommission it. So the old style nuclear power plants are a danger in and of themselves, as we've seen with Fukushima, as we've seen with, with Chernobyl, as we've seen with Three Mile Island and many other cases. Yes. There, are, there are probably dozens of unreported accidents, leaks of radiation um, into water, into air. That's not the risks that I'm talking about today. There's an understudied, underrated risk that's far greater, especially in this current era of pandemic. In all of these conventional old style nuclear power plants, and I say old style because there is a technology that would be safer and more beneficial and, and people like James Hansen say, we have to consider liquid salt thorium reactors as part of the energy mix going forward, or nations are gonna to continue to burn coal. Okay, so there's a case to be made for liquid, thorium, uh, liquid salt thorium nuclear reactors. So the risk that I'm talking about is the spent fuel rods that are currently being kept cool at 450 some odd nuclear reactors around the earth. There are no depositories that any nation has created as far as I know for the safe long-term storage of these spent nuclear fuel rods. Uh, when I say long-term, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of years perhaps we're talking about half lives in the tens or hundreds of thousands of years. So these spent fuel rods need to be kept safe somewhere in a geologically stable place, safe from terrorist invasion for such a long time that it is not clear that the same language we speak today will be spoken at that point in the future. Mind boggling. And, and when it's been thought that the entrance, well, let me discuss the one that was proposed in the US, Yucca Mountain, mm -hmm. it was entertained as the site for nuclear, for the deposition of the, the long-term storage of this nuclear waste. Mm -hmm. But they were concerned that once they sealed it up, how could they label the entrance so that no one would go in? Skull and crossbones couldn't be used because skull and crossbones has become a symbol of entertainment. That's okay. Astonishing. It's no longer a danger symbol. 
Um, there, okay. Now this may be going into too much detail, but these spent fuel rods are an extreme long-term danger. And if they're not kept cool, then they will boil off the water gradually, evaporate and boil off the water that they're sitting in. There's still heat in them. Mm -hmm. they weren't, there wasn't enough heat in them to make them efficient for the generation of steam power. So they were decommissioned and put into these chill cooling ponds. And they exist in the hundreds, in the thousands probably, since there are 450 nuclear reactors around the earth that have these. There are thousands of these sitting in, in swimming pools being chilled forever, virtually forever. Mm -hmm. Well, if during this pandemic, the economic system, the civilization within a, a weak community, a weak nation, where that nation has been given or sold a nuclear power plant by one of the nuclear powers, China, France, United States. If that nation becomes unstable and their grid goes down or everyone goes home to be with their family, and there are only a few people left on site, there are grave concerns that these spent fuel rods will go this aisle and there will be a, an explosion. Now to complete my briefing, it's been calculated by the supercomputers within the United States that it would only take about 12 or 13 of these going off at once to totally fry the UV layer, the UV protective layer of, of Earth, and thereby sterilize all the terrestrial surface and the, the first layer of, of marine surface before the, the radiation was stopped by, by the water. Um, they keep these fuel rods in water because the water will absorb the radiation that's going, that's being emitted. And so you get highly radioactive water as a byproduct. Okay, we've got a problem. As the meme goes, Houston, we've got a problem. In the age of pandemic, it's a huge problem that these waste fuel ponds, waste spent fuel ponds will be, um, potentially the subject of, of explosion. And that could come about by other means than even a breakdown of the grid, the electric grid in that nation. It could come about by ineptness, by terrorism, by, okay, so. It's, it's an astonishing, it's an astonishing problem. It's a, a devastating issue with inconceivable impact, only compounded by a. I mean, there are so many concerns. A, the the number of the number, as you articulate, of um, of these facilities, um, compounded with the fact with the Trump administration, um, and even right now with climate change and what we're facing, even in California as we speak and the pandemic. I'm not sure we can count out our own, um, <laughs> the danger to our, um, to the United States. And I mentioned that clearly there are many, many countries where these facilities um, exist. There's a, I know that right now, some of the biggest concerns are in a lot of um, Eastern European states, form it, former Soviet states. Uh, just there's been a lot of recent activity in the US. In fact, just, uh, just last week, uh, the NRC wrapped up its discussions on the proposed, the uh, public process for the proposed um, facility in New Mexico, the proposed multi-billion dollar facility to house several hundred of these dry cask storage containers. So actually, let me back, I have a lot of things we could talk about, but let me back up and, and talk about what some of the, what have been posed as some of the solutions. Um, one of them is um, repositories. I'd be interested in what you think about that. One of them is dry cask storage. Um, and, and it's, uh, what are your thoughts on the dry cask storage? 
It's been, um, it is a solution. It has been challenging in the United States. Um, in fact, also this week we had reported um, in, in, uh, in California, they are struggling with, um, of, with these casks, how they can be implemented, how they can be fixed when they leak. Do they need to be immersed in water again, even to be addressed? I mean, there are a lot of technical and substantive issues, even the United States for these dry casks, but what, what, how do you see them as being a part of the solution? Okay. Um, my contacts with the U.S. intelligence community, they contacted me because they were wanting a scientific communicator to start discussing this publicly, to build political support, political will, public support for a rapid, rapid deployment cask and contain task force. That's what it was being called. Cask and contain. Okay, now the name that you'll find on the internet is dry cask storage. That was felt to be a mm, dry, pretty boring name. <laughs> came up with cask and contain as a snappier way of saying it. And the idea was that there's a direct risk to the United States that should an enemy power with the capability of exploding what's known as an electromagnetic pulse device, which is a basically a nuclear device, but it's not a, uh, it doesn't kill people. It brings down the grid. It overloads the grid. Or should there be solar flares that bring down the grid? There are about two weeks of bunker fuel, that is diesel fuel on average, kept on site to run the chillers for these waste ponds, after which we got a big problem. So in the United States alone, we have the need for a rapid deployment cask and contained task force for our own security, but the need globally is huge. Now this was a program that was approved during Obama's last year in office but it was not implemented quickly enough and Trump took over and he cares, he could care less about nuclear safety. In fact, in 2019, there were a raft of articles, I think on July 17th in the major papers about how Trump wanted to defund the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. He wanted to cut their budget and instead of inspecting every other year, go to every third year, and various other ways to save money. Excuse me? You want to save money at the expense of nuclear safety? How more stupid can you be? And out, outrageous, and I, I'll mention that just, just this um, spring, it was reported you know, that the Development Finance Corporation, the Trump, through the Trump administration, has proposed that development funds be allowed to be used for nuclear power, which would be a first um, for the international community and is shocking when you think of encouraging the development of this power exactly in, as you were saying in um, nations that may or may not have the financial, economic wherewithal or expertise to fully you know, contain that. Now Trump, Trump's impulse in that is not that he wants to help these countries. Exactly. Or he wants to basically, I'm sure he will tie those funds to the use of Westinghouse General Electric yes. as the contract. And that was my, that was exactly my point. It's about boosting the U.S. Um, nuclear industry as is this deregulation at the expense of safety that you were mentioning from last year. Absolutely, that's my point. So it's- It's, it's shocking, uh, it's shocking. It's shocking and we need to publish this program and other programs. I'm, I'm going to be making appointments with people who have studied these waste uh, fuel issues as well as other issues of nuclear. You and I are communicating on it, though neither of us is expert in the area. 
but we need to start getting these dis this discussed publicly. Beth, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And I am certainly not a, a nuclear expert, although I um, do have a lot of experience in energy policy. And something that struck me is the way that these nuclear waste issues uh, have in, in many, just like all pollution, have been positioned as an externality, you know, as a business concern. In the, drug. Right. And, and that the actual policy is, is that it is the government that is responsible for that waste, yeah. um, which, it, which is um, a, a cost that is ballooning um, in the multi-billion dollars um, for what that cost is. And also policy issues of national international concern are, you know, what are the, what are the standards for a, any facility in terms of how much security do they need to provide, you know, for their own, their own facility or what that, um, the actual government where they're housed in will provide. And, and that states are responsible for their own nuclear waste yet. States, you, know, that, you mean national states, not- Yes, states correct. States. Not, sorry, jumping to the international level, yes. And that actually got, gets me to wanna to ask you, you know, another one of the solutions in addition to, addition to dry cast storage is, you know, the idea of having these kinds of repositories um, uh, that would be um, sort of stewarded by the international community would be located, query how they would figure out how they'd be locate, located in terms of how you cask and contain. How does one even begin to think about where one contains? <laughs> yeah. And especially because within the 50 United States, nobody wants it in their backyard. So the Yucca Mountain in Nevada was rejected. Um, I was not aware that there's another one on just discussion for New Mexico, but mm -hmm. very doubtful that the citizenry in New Mexico is gonna be happy about that. Trump's basically taking nuclear safety and making it a cost savings by getting rid of it. Um, essentially, he's made nuclear safety a voluntary program. We are embedded in a global economic system that will avoid any decision in favor of the environment or future generations or safety if it's an expense item. They will avoid it. You use the term externality. That's a formal term, but yes, the risk of nuclear uh, accidents is an externality. That is, we don't factor it in if we can help it. We don't set aside reserves if we can help it. Gosh, how many companies don't set aside reserves for their, their unfunded retirement plans? So they're gonna set aside funding for the unforeseeable accident, which will never happen. Don't worry, nuclear, completely safe. Don't worry. So. The, 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 <laughs> the, the, the way there has certainly been a trend, um, the way that these types of projects are financed um, and the short term, the fo with the focus on short term gain, uh, which is, is your, you're alluding to in the general, but I think is also very, very true in the specific, um, is terrifying and abdicates um, any type of moral or social responsibility to the world, <laughs> to the planet, to individuals, um, if you're going to externalize that type of risk, which is of course what, you know, what, uh, what Wall Street is all about. And the force, the powers that be will do everything they can to continue that was just adding to your point, which is what your point was. And, and I'm, I was going to say that we are currently saddled with a, a commander in chief um, who has no moral compass and would be willing to, to compromise anything, including risks to life on earth at this point in order to get reelected. It's, it's just shocking. Okay, we have a system that is in, um, in crisis, but the system itself refuses to acknowledge the crisis because 
to acknowledge it as a threat to wealth, to the already wealthy. That's right. What makes, what makes you at this point, at this time, so focused on this nuclear issue? Why is this so important right now, do you think, at this time in your life, in well, your well, life got, of advocacy? I've got cancer. And I've been told that the, can, the kind of cancer I have is one that no one has remission from. So I have a, a, a limited expiration date. I can extend my life if I, if I do things correctly. Um, how much I can extend it is unclear. Uh, but I regard it as part of my legacy, part of what I leave behind me will be the open discussion, starting a discussion so that it's known that this risk exists and, and something as arcane as dry cask storage or cask and contain. These fuel rods that are out of sight, out of mind, um, it needs to be brought, brought to international focus that this is a, a lurking threat in many nations. And in theory, they could happen at any, at any time, correct, for any number of reasons. Yes. And as I said, it will only take 12 or 13, it's been calculated by the Summit supercomputer, it would only take 12 or 13 of them going off at once to fry off the ozone layer, uh, which protects the Earth from ultraviolet radiation. Now, I dubbed that, God forbid, that event, a nuclear popcorn ball. And um, I believe the, uh, the Intel community liked the term, and I not, would not be surprised if it's being used internally in communications. But I want to get that term out there as a hashtag. Nuclear popcorn. <laughs> I laugh as I say it. There's nothing funny about it. No, but then it, popcorn ball or nuclear popcorn. We'll see which is the better. And, and the the thinking behind that is that it's these. It's it. All, this would be terrible in any case. But that the uh, that it's it's sort of a is it the popcorn effect in terms of multiple happening at one time? Is that where the popcorn comes in? Okay. Or no? <laughs> well, I just imagined the Earth with twelve or thirteen or twenty. Fukushima's spewing radiations into the atmosphere. And so to me, that, that looked like a popcorn ball. You know? That imagery will is now stuck in my mind. Yeah. It also it goes to how fundamental, well, I'm interested what you think, but how fundamental the question of our practices and our pollution, as much as as much and as dire as climate change is a near-term threat, and I've spent my career um, trying to prevent its more catastrophic effects, as I know that you have dedicated much of your life to, the waste issues, just the pollution and waste issues, the ecological destruction pose, you know, writ large, um, pose as serious and dire and immediate a threat. Um, interestingly enough, I wanted to bring this into our conversation. If one goes to the Wikipedia article on dry cask storage, um, it mentions the topic. There's not a depth discussion by any means, but I went down to the citations and I found two external links to YouTubes that looked like they were made in the 1950s. They were from previous from decades ago. And these were the government's attempt to make us all comfortable that it's under control. And so they have some uh, lovely young woman with a hard hat on, which is the symbol of authority and safety. You know, they were posed, but they have her approaching the camera and describing how these fuel rods are safe in their storage and they will be moved to a long-term de 
repository, which has never happened. Um, so basically, the whole issue was put out of sight, out of mind, and and I've been asked to bring it up again as strongly as possible. What are some of the ways? Um, what are some of the ways that we can do that? Who who should care about this? <laughs> Anyone who's got children or anyone who knows someone who's got children, anyone who's concerned about life in general, anyone who has, has a moral ethical compass. I mean, you know, you can think about how, oh yeah, poor polar bears or, or um, save the whales or, or all of these campaigns which have, have plucked at the heartstrings and I'm not belittling any of them but I'm being sardonic in how humanity will focus on the polar bears for six months and then it becomes overused and nobody wants to hear about it anymore. Um, you know, come on, tell me the news, what's the news? Even the concept of news that it has to have changed from yesterday to today to be important means that anything that's a slow moving threat is off the radar something has to happen to make it a newsworthy item. You have to have a Fukushima. You know, you, it's, humanity is not well disposed psychologically for the factoring of long-term risks. Yes, yes. Okay, we, are, we evolved responding to immediate threats, whether it be fire or a wild beast or or the, or the coronavirus, which we were not able to accept the invisible threat of until it was upon us and overtook, uh, overtook us. Uh, and which we are still having a problem with. I go out, um, Hawaii, where I live, is in lockdown mode. You're allowed to go in the water, but you're not allowed to sit on the beach. And so the police cars will, will and have given out very large sum tickets. I think they handed out $1,500, $500 fines uh, for people who've been sitting on the beach. You can go into the water and then you have to come out of the water, shower, dry off, whatever, go home. Um, we take it seriously. And yet people exercising around the park that lies on the other side of the, uh, the road from the beach will be jogging without a mask, will be walking without a mask. I can understand how it's harder to jog if you've got a mask on because you have to pull in and exhale large amounts of air. But people will just be walking around with the mask on their chin. And I've been so tempted to say, you know, the mask works better if you actually have it over your mouth. And <laughs> I know, it's not, a, your mask is not a beard. <laughs> when you, <laughs> when you mentioned Hawaii again, it makes it, it makes me think of, think of how the United States, in addition to other countries, has been completely unable to deal with the legacy of, of nuclear waste. Um, and it makes me think of the nuclear waste that is now seeping into the Pacific, you know, uh, the Bikini Atoll, the you know, and the people um, who are still getting sick, you know, from those initial experiments all that time ago and how tragic and oh, inhumane and in, incomprehensible that is. And that like to what you're saying, it's old, old news. <laughs> the refusal to deal with the legacy of this waste. And now look where we are. Look where we are.